First, heathen does not mean you don't have a religion. Uh, heathen is the term that uh, Bishop Okulas used to translate Gentile. Uh, Amy, would you like to take that and turn off the technology? <laughs> it, it's that outside pocket, you know. Just press a button and then unpress it. <laughs> yeah, that was a good smile. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> right, put your cell phones on stun, please. Uh, the, uh, it, it, the, he used it to translate the word Gentile to mean people who are not Christian. Uh, and of course, Christians meant that you had decided that meant you had no religion. Uh, it was the people out in the country. Uh, it's pretty much the Germanic equivalent of the people. How's this? Is this helping? How about this? Okay. Good. Uh, I've been active in, I've been in the process of becoming a heathen and uh, becoming a heathen leader for about 30 years now. And I have seen our tradition develop and grow. Uh, we are, to some extent, in that uh, conflict between purity and uh, adaptability, where we are both trying to reconstruct uh, an ancient pre-Christian Northern European faith, uh, and also try to make it relevant to the contemporary world, which is uh, essentially what I want to talk about. Uh, in my opinion, and, and this is all my opinion, because uh, heathens are very independent and very argumentative people, and nobody uh, has the right to speak for all of heathenry. So if you encounter others, uh, they may or may not agree with me. But I see it as having three basic pillars. Uh, the first is the gods and goddesses of Northern Europe. The second is honor to the ancestors. This in, does not necessarily mean just white ancestors. This means whoever your ancestors are. Uh, I remember one uh, ceremony where we were passing the horn around and honoring people. And uh, a guy gets up and he praises his great, great, great grandfather who fought at the Battle of the Alamo. And at the end, he says, he was fighting for Bishop Torbena. And we all cheered, because that was the point, to, to honor your ancestors, whoever they are and where they come from. Uh, the third element is that we also honor uh, all of the spirits of the land. And uh, like other indigenous religions, the people of Northern Europe were very, very aware of the uh, spiritual ecology and the necessity to understand and work with that spiritual ecology, with the, the spirits of the land, in order to make a living. Now, this didn't stop the uh, Norwegians who immigrated into Iceland from cutting all down, down all the trees that were there, such as they were, and uh, deforesting the island within the first generation or so. But uh, at least they had a concept. And they had to adapt uh, from seeing their spirits living in the forests to seeing them living in the rocks, of which Iceland has a great many. <laughs> so in that experience, we have a, an example of how a, a, a culture can immigrate to a new land and reestablish that spiritual relationship with it. And I think that that may prove to be very important. Um, one of the books that was not listed in my bio uh, is a trilogy called Bodan's Children, uh, which is on the Siegfried legend. And what interested me about that story was that the, in the fifth century, uh, all of the tribes were coming in from the north and moving from the east towards the west, and they moved into the lands that are now the nations of modern Europe and gave them their names, such as 
Frankland and Germany. And at that point, if they were coming in and, and the Romans and Celts were going, oh dear, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, now, they cannot remember a time when they weren't there. But I wondered, as an American, we're always moving around, how do you, when you move into a new land, what do you do? How do you make those connections? So that whole element of migration, uh, I think, is part of the, the cultural background that I am working with as a heathen. And that, I think, is going to become very important in the future, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, I think I can then move to my scheduled talk here. Um, I think as people of faith, we have to frame our response to climate change and to end times, if that's what it is, uh, in the imagery and from the theology of our faith. So we have to start, and that's where we're searching whatever scriptures we have. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the poem uh, by Robert Frost, which begins, Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Now, uh, he's using the poem to talk about the conflicting forces of desire and hatred, but when I, as a heathen, look at those words, I see something else. I see the references to fire and ice as the, the, the primal elements from which uh, the world was made, the universe was made. And uh, those images recall all of the references to creation and, and destruction that we find in Norse mythology. Uh, towards the end of Volusbao, the first poem in the Elder Edda, which is a collection of uh, poetry from the pre-Christian period that got written down uh, just before or near the beginning of the conversion period. And at the end of Volospao, we have a description of the end of the world, of the end times. Are you from uh, the universe? No. It's so Energy. noisy. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, the, the Volospao has a description of Ragnarok. Uh, when you talk to what, what, what the first thing that most people may think of when they hear that name is uh, Wagner's opera. And uh, that may be all that people know about the heathen tradition. Uh, and then when you talk to heathens, especially young male heathens, uh, when the mead is going around at Sundles and everybody's getting very mellow and enthusiastic, and quite often some young guy will get up and where that he's going to fight beside the gods at Ragnarok. Uh, I look at that a little differently. Uh, in my opinion, that war may have already started. And to join in the fight, if we want to be all gung-ho and heroic, we need to understand what the enemy actually is. So I also have to say that what I'm, this is my opinion because heathens are very opinionated and uh, you will get six arguments when you have five people. <laughs> uh, these are my conclusions based on my observation and my understanding of the lore, which is not scripture in the Christian sense. It is, uh, we're fortunate to have quite a large body of literature, most of it written down by Icelanders, but we have uh, also some material from the continent, from Germany. So, um, in the Younger Edda, Snorri Sturluson, who was writing in the 13th century, he was a Christian, but the basis for Icelandic poetry, and Icelandic poets were at that point the, one of the chief exports from Ireland, but Iceland, excuse me. Uh, and the poetry was based on references to the old mythology. And he was afraid that the younger poets were losing that information, so he wrote a book. And he says about the creation, uh, just as from Niflheim there arose coldness and all things grim, so what was facing close to Muspel was hot and bright, but Ganungagap was as mild as a windless sky. And when the rime and the blowing of the warmth met so that it thawed and dripped, there was a quickening from these flowing drops 
due to the power of the source of the heat, and it became the form of a being, and he was given the name Emir. Uh, this is similar in some ways to some of the Hindu ideas of the primal being. But you have here the, the heat and cold as, as those primal elements. So the body of Midgard, the, the, the body of Emir, uh, the gods made Midgard, which is our world, and there are other worlds that other beings live in. Now, uh, some of, it's pretty clear that some of the imagery is so very vivid because Snorri lived in Iceland. If you've ever been to Iceland, this is a land of fire and ice. Uh, the middle part is covered by glaciers and surrounded by lava flows and every so often uh, another volcano goes off. Uh, it's also where the uh, European plate meets the North American plate, so it's a very liminal place. It's fascinating. Uh, it's also rather unstable, and there's little twitchy earthquakes all the time, and occasionally a great big one, and occasionally a volcano such as Ayafjallajökull uh, erupts, as it did in 2010, and shut down transportation in Europe. Uh, so, this relationship between creation and destruction, if, if you're in Iceland, this becomes very clear. And the other thing that's clear when you look at Iceland is the idea that things can change. Uh, the primal cataclysm of the, when fire encountered ice was the, the origin of creation in archaeology. Uh, someday this balance will tip and that will be the end of the world as we know it. Uh, that is what we, the Norse version of the end times uh, often referred to as the twilight of the gods, although actually uh, it, a better translation is the final destiny of the divine powers. Uh, sometimes it's also called the time when the gods die or will be destroyed, or Alverblok, the end of the age. Uh, some of the things that happen that, that lead up to this final battle, uh, the weather goes crazy. Uh, civilization falls. Brothers will battle to blood the end, and sisters' sons their sib betray. Woes in the world, much wantonness, axe age, sword age, thunders our shield, wind age, wolf age, ere the world crumbles, will the fear of no man spare the other. But it gets worse. <laughs> to quote Snorri again, after the sun and moon have been swallowed by wolves, there will take place another event. The whole earth and mountains will shake so much that trees will become uprooted from the earth and the mountains will fall and bonds will snap and break. Then Fenris wolves will get free. Then the ocean will surge up onto the lands because the Midgard serpent will fly into a giant rage and make its way ashore. And there's also heat. Uh, when the giant surfer leads out the hosts of Muspelheim, which is the world of fire, it's with his sword that shines more brightly than the sun. The sun turned dark and the land sank into the sea. The bright stars fell from heaven. Steam and fire ferment. Flames leap high to heaven itself. Um, when a number of years ago, we had a firestorm in Oakland, in Oakland Hills. And one reason why the, this happened was the combination of hot, dry wind blowing in, and the fact that the, the natural ecological way that, that undergrowth is handled in California is to burn off the undergrowth periodically. But nobody had done that. It had not been allowed to happen for far too long. So when the fire got started, it was a firestorm, and the, the wind was drawing the flames down the ravines that head toward the bay. And you could look and see these all flames sort of marching down the ravine, and I looked at that, and I went, oh, so that's what the sons of Surfer look like. Because you could feel this destructive rage in those flames. And, you know, just a few weeks, two, three weeks ago now, uh, people I know living in Lake County had exactly the same thing happen with explosive uh, fire that was the worst that any of the firefighters had ever seen. You know, and then there's South Carolina, which is getting the other end of things with water. Uh, extreme weather. Now, the reason why I put this in theological terms is that uh, in uh, 
few who fought. And you remember, I mentioned the land spirits. Well, there's a whole sequence of land spirits from the, the great elemental powers down to the spirit that lives in a stone or a tree or a flower or whatever. Uh, the great powers are uh, anthropomorphized as the Yotnars, the giants. Uh, giants are not necessarily sort of bum big bumbling beings that you can outwit. Uh, they are natural forces and uh, they fall into two categories. There are the, the ones that the gods are on visiting terms with. In fact, if you look at the creation story, all of the gods are either uh, descended from and or married to giants. So clearly the giants and the gods are sort of the same kind of being. Uh, they are very big beings. The, uh, but the ones that turn up at Ragnarok are not the ones that are mentioned in the stories in which the gods interact with them. They are the ones who live in Utgard, and which is the wilderness, which is the place outside of the garth, the place outside of the, the, the bonds, the walls that men make. Uh, and the whole relationship with the wilderness is a very interesting one because it is not only the, uh, a source of danger and strangeness, but it is also a source of renewal. And so uh, people go out into the wilderness and uh, the outlaws are in the wilderness, the powers are in the wilderness, but, but people also go there for inspiration and spiritual connection. Um, the story of Ragnarok as it's told in Boleslaw, if you analyze it, and a guy named John McKinnell, in fact, wrote a very interesting article doing a line-by-line -line comparison of the Boleslaw Ragnarok story with uh, the Book of Revelation. Uh, in the, the conversion period, a lot of the Viking traders would go and get prime signed, which was a kind of a proto-baptism. And once they had been gotten that, then they, uh, Christians were allowed to trade with them. So they figured, okay, another god, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the uh, teaching that was given to those, to them in the, the prime sign, signing uh, workshop, or whatever they called it, uh, was uh, that information is some of the information that we find in Boleslaw, some of the similarities. So, but there are some differences. One of them is that in, in the, the Christian story, it is a one-way trip. It is set in history, and therefore uh, you have either evolution or devolution, but it's all going one way. And when it's over, it's over. Uh, I think this is because with the G Jesus as a historical figure, and we still experience time most of the time uh, as a one-way progression. Um, Alderbach, on the other hand, is the end of an age. And that brings us back to pagan ideas, which tend to be circular. And so, uh, although the, the new world that follows the uh, climactic battle at the end of Ragnarok has some similarities to the uh, world that follows the end of the end times, um, it sounds much more like a new age of the earth than it does like a heavenly kingdom. And of course, a lot of the other pagan traditions, uh, with the Hopi, for instance, in the Navajo, you have people moving through a series of, of levels and worlds. Uh, and of course, the Hindus, as Greg mentioned, uh, have a, a whole extremely elaborate series of ages. Uh, and in Hindu cosmology, uh, the universe is created and destroyed every uh, 4.1 to 8.2 billion years, <coughs> which is a, a yuga. And the cycle, cycles repeat like the seasons and they wax and wane. Uh, now, of course, science also has that, that concept of ages. Uh, if th those of you who saw, have seen the first uh, Fantasia movie, where they, they did that wonderful evocation of the, the cycles uh, to the music of Ripe Spring. Uh, very effective. Uh, for years, I had nightmares about those poor dinosaurs marching through the drought-stricken land. 
Um, anyway, so we have, in geological terms, uh, periods of, uh, let's see, four and a half eons of half a billion years or more each, uh, including a total of 10 eras, which involve several hundred million years each, epochs of tens of millions of years, and ages, which are millions of years long. We are now living in the Quaternary period, which includes the Holocene, which began 11,700 years ago, and its predecessor, the Pleistocene, lasting a little over two and a half million years. So that gives us an idea of about how long an age of the Earth is supposed to last. And, and we accept, and we've got plenty of evidence, the Earth does change periodically. The question is, how long is that period supposed to be? Uh, each time things change, you have the emergence of a new ecosystem. Uh, we, and our cultures, and our gods, are all the product of the Holocene. Uh, even though there are some survivals from the Pleistocene, and it turned, especially in relation to, I think, the uh, elemental powers. Okay, so given such a time scale, we, we could just say, and I think we used to be able to say, well, someday things will happen, and uh, the natural disasters that we are uh, experiencing, there have always been natural disasters, and uh, like individual and social disasters, uh, we could, could say, be philosophical and say, like the, the Anglo-Saxon poet Dior, that past the social this. Or will it? Uh, when I first read Robespell many years ago, I looked at the description and thought it sounded like nuclear winter. Uh, since then, uh, I have uh, been looking at current events and realized that whatever wiped out the dinosaurs, they didn't do it to themselves, at least as far as we can tell. Uh, ours is the first generation that has the technology to upset the balance so profoundly that the ecosystems within which we and our culture developed can be, might be damaged beyond our ability to recover. And the thing that really pisses me off is the idea that as whatever disaster overwhelms me uh, comes rolling in, that I, I think we did it to ourselves. Uh, so what does this have to do with the war between the gods and the giants? Um, if you read a children's book of mythology, you get the idea that the gods are good and the giants are bad. But as I was saying a little earlier, that's not necessarily the case. There are giants and then there are giants. There's the, the wild and unbalanced ones and the uh, ones which are the great powers of nature that have to exist in, in, in interaction in order for things to happen. Uh, the, uh, my basic theory is that uh, Ragnarok can be defined as what happens when the only elemental powers remaining are the ones that are out of balance. Mm. So that is how, as a heathen, I am framing my response. Uh, so, uh, So a lot of cultures have a myth of a war between the gods and the giants. In, in Greco-Roman mythology, for instance, it, they call them the Titans, which is etymologically related to Jotun and Etan. Uh, and uh, the difference in the Norse version is that when, uh, rather than defeating the giants and, and imprisoning them underground, uh, from whence you always have the, the fear that they might break free. In the Norse system, uh, they, there's a very interesting passage uh, in which Thor uh, says that he's been in the east uh, killing giants. And in fact, it's not even killing giants, it's most, mostly killing giantesses. Because in the, uh, the, the female is more deadly than the male, apparently, in the uh, theology. Um, and the reason that he is killing them is not because they are intrinsically evil and worthy of destruction, but because 
Much might would the Jotnar have if all lived, little might would men have in Midgard. Mm -hmm. So I interpret that to mean that what he's doing is keeping the balance. Uh, and even in the Marvel comics and the movies, Thor is the great protector. He's the defender of the gods, he's the de defender of humankind. He is also the son of uh, Odin, who is very much associated with the wind, and uh, Bjorn, who is primal earth. And uh, he's associated with, his powers have to do with the lightning and the thunder. And if you dig into the science, um, lightning and thunder is what happens when the power of the earth draws down the energy from the, the wild winds and clouds. And then it goes like this, and, and behold, there's Thor. So having, I'm sure Snorri and the other old writers had no idea of this, but in fact, uh, Thor is the son of earth and sky. Um, so, if for some reason Thor is no longer able to maintain that balance, that's when the end times or Ragnarok begin because only the unbalanced powers are left. So, um, my title of this next comment is Taking Up the Staff. One of the things that I do is the old oracular practice, and the, the women who did that were called staff bearers. And uh, I didn't bring my staff with me, but I have one. Uh, however, it in, in itself, you know, just going whack whack, uh, is not going to be enough to stave off Ragnarok. Uh, when an inconvenient truth came out, there was a while where I knew it was out there, I knew I ought to watch it, I didn't want to watch it because I knew that it was going to be depressing uh, and possibly inconvenient. <laughs> Uh, finally, I gave in, and I sat there and, and cried. Uh, at the end, Thor gets up and he says, if you are a leader in your community, you should go do something. And I thought, oh, okay, here I am. Um, I have, I'm the leader of one of the longest lived uh, human kindreds I know about. Uh, I've been a leader in my community. I have titles and so forth. Oh dear, that means I have to do something. And uh, so I also, that the, of, of the Norse gods, the one, that, the one that I work with most closely is Odin. And Odin is uh, the uh, most talky of the gods, and perhaps the most pushy, in that a number of people have uh, quite spontaneously been encountered him. Uh, he, in the, the old stories, he is the one who is most involved with preparing for Ragnarok. So on a personal spiritual uh, level, I think one of the reasons why he talks to me is because he thought I might be able to do something and that he's tried to get a hold of anybody who th he thinks he can get to do something. Uh, because the gods, uh, just like us, would like to see our ecosystem and world continue. Uh, so he is, collecting heroes. Uh, these days we have learned to define heroes in a number of different ways. So I think that in addition to people who can swing a sword, he also has people who are good at communications technology and, and other relevant skills. So uh, he's trying to keep the destiny of the gods from coming to pass before uh, it's appointed time. He recognizes eventually, yeah, but, but not now, please. Uh, you may have heard of the three Norns, who are sort of the equivalent of the three fates. And their names uh, are, come from parts of speech of the verb to be. So, Urd is uh, the past. That is what has, as we say, has been laid down in the will. And that, those things you can't change. They're there, they're part of, of what we have to work with. Uh, the second Norn, Verdandi, is a present participle. Verdandi is where we live. Verdandi is that coming into being, beingness, uh, that's always changing. And that's where we make our choices. And every time we make a choice, 
that choice then gets laid down in the will and becomes part of words. So our choices are very, very important. Schuld doesn't mean the future. Uh, it means the probable future. This is something that we realized when we started doing oracular work, that uh, with our seriousness didn't, occasionally an answer comes through that, that feels just so strong that it's an extremely high probability. But very often uh, there will be an answer that says something like, I see three roads, and if you go down this one, this is likely to happen, and this one, and so forth. And uh, analyzing um, oracular responses in other traditions, such as uh, Delphi, you actually see similar things. So I think that the only thing that can be predicted is probabilities. And the, so what Schuld has to say will change depending on the choices we make while we're in Brazandi. Uh, so, um, Another thing that Odin is involved with is he's a god of consciousness. And changing consciousness is one of the things that we really, really need to do just now. Uh, when I first put this paper together, and when I uh, titled it Staving Off Ragnarok, uh, I thought, okay, let's get together and do the stuff that Al Gore says we should be doing and, and uh, fight and maybe we can make it not happen. Uh, my kindred responded by trying to change some of our habits. For instance, uh, a big part of our practice is uh, feasts at the holidays. So we now have to raise more money than we ever used to because we only buy sustainably raised meat for those feasts. And rather than using paper plates, we uh, have permanent plates and we wash them carefully because we're in California and we don't have all the water that we're supposed to have either. Uh, so trying to change people's habits and make them more aware, uh, we also as a kindred are trying to identify and make contact with our local uh, seasonal streams, which is what you have in California. Uh, and, and get a develop a relationship with the Lady of the Waters. Now that leads me to uh, where I have had to change what I'm saying here, because I no longer believe we can stop it. So now I turn to history, and uh, in the discussion of is what I and my fellow heathens doing. Uh, are we practicing an indigenous religion? This is the religion that was indigenous to Northern Europe. Uh, I think in the case of Rob's group in Pennsylvania, it has definitely, be, in all senses of the term, become indigenous to America. But most of, of those who practice heathenry today have moved and are not living on the land that their grandparents or great-grandparents, much less distant ancestors, lived in. However, when I look at uh, history, um, I note that not only did the Norwegians emigrate to Iceland, but uh, in the, there's a whole era called the Migrations Period because all of the Germanic tribes were moving around. Mm -hmm. And to me as an American, that has uh, great relevance. And you'll tell me when I'm running out of time. <laughs> uh, so I think Migrating, pe peoples migrate. Uh, some of the Native American tribes even live in re recent, the recent memory have migrated. The Lakota were first uh, recorded living in Pennsylvania. They migrated to the, the plains and they changed some of their ways. But what the indigenous religions do not change is the relationship to the land, the earth religion. And I think that is uh, the, the two things I get out of my faith when addressing this is first, uh, however our environment changes, we have to use the, our spiritual technology for connecting with the earth. And if, if the spirits are wild uh, or if the environment changes, uh, we, 
we have to join with them. And this is not the same thing as stewardship. It's a much more egalitarian uh, perspective. And I think that that recognition that uh, humans are only one kind of spirit on this earth, and that we have to, uh, we relate not only to the gods, but uh, to, uh, and to our ancestors, what, whoever they are, but to the spirits in whatever piece of earth we are living on, and especially when they're changing. The other thing that, that is, is perhaps a more specifically heathen uh, attitude is to be willing to fight. Uh, the part of the serenity prayer that a heathen would recognize would be the courage to change the things we can. And uh, who are our enemies? Uh, the enemies that threaten us are the unbalanced natural forces. But the enemies that we can fight are things like falsehood and greed and fear. So communication and education wherever, however we can find ways to, to do that are the weapons that we need to use. And I think that's a place where we have a lot in common with everybody else here. Um, the, uh, there, there's one, one of the most affecting pieces of the old literature is a poem called The Battle of Maldon, which is an Anglo-Saxon uh, poem about a bunch of Anglo-Saxons who go out to try to fight off the invading Danes. And their leader is an earl who is a very noble and honorable, uh, I would say chivalrous, but that's not quite the same culture. And when the Danish chieftain says, well, you know, we're, we're over here and the ground is bad and we can't really fight you, why don't you let us come over? And the Anglo-Saxon earl says, sure, a good fair fight. Well, the Danes come over and the Anglo-Saxons get creamed. Uh, the, the Earl falls fairly early on. He is surrounded by his house guard and uh, half the army is running away. And Bergwald, the old retainer, uh, basically says, the, the worse it gets, the more we will stand fast. And I think uh, that is particularly heathen attitude, which is uh, even if even if you're afraid you're going to fail, it is better to do all you can for as long as you can. Uh, the other, uh, an additional, another thing, um, as heathens and as part of the larger pagan community and as the pagan community is has connections to the other earth religions and the indigenous communities. I'm coming to the conclusion that just standing fast and being brave all by yourself uh, is, is maybe good for you as a person, but it isn't gonna achieve much. So I think that it is important for the heathen community, and I probably am gonna have to do some advertising and education on that. We have to make connections and work with all of the other earth religions because we are going to need people who have the spiritual uh, technology to become aware of and work with the land spirits in order to for anything to survive this and so i think that's where i will leave you leave you and we can have some questions I should just add, uh, if you want to learn more about the, the, this kind of uh, pagan religion, we will be doing a panel at, God uh, help us, 8.15 tomorrow morning <laughs> on the reconstruction of uh, religions. Thank you. <laughs> so, questions? Yes. If you would, uh, Maybe elaborate a bit on paganism, neo-paganism, and where you see heathenism uh, right. sort of fitting into that rubric and what some of the right. other pillars are within that. Um, at the, 
1993 at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. This was when paganism sort of came on the interface scene, uh, and it was Wiccan. Um, the Covenant of the Goddess, which is a federation of Wiccan groups. And we all got together and we did a full moon ritual, which was a, a great surprise to them who attended because it was not shocking. <laughs> and uh, so Wicca is the kind of, of neo-paganism that is the best known. Uh, what has happened since 1993 is that a number of organizations that were uh, just really forming have had a chance to settle in and grow. And a number of these are what we call the Reconstructionist uh, pagan traditions, which are people who are working within the context of one cultural place. So uh, on the panel, for instance, we will have uh, me for heathenry in general and uh, Rob Schreier for Uglava, which is the native Pennsylvania Deitch heathenry. And Elisheva for primitive Hebrews. Uh, we'll have Aaron Laurie for Celtic and Kirk for the ADF, which you'll have to explain. I know, I don't quite fit in that. Which is kind of, well, you do. Uh, and uh, Gwendolyn Reese for uh, the Greek. And uh, those are, isn't even all of them. But, uh, so does that sufficient? Well, yeah, I, I, because a lot of time people talk about different strains of, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and paganism itself is a kind of a jump term. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, Christianity yeah, where you have right. everything from. Yeah, so I, 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 I'd like to kind of yeah. get a better feel for some of the. You yeah, know, and, and just as there, there are some, yeah. some fundamentalists who don't just think, realize that Catholics are Christians. Um, you know, there are other, some pagans who don't accept all the other pagans. But, you know, that's human belief. <clears throat> okay, another question. Or send me one. <laughs> <laughs> Could I? Yes, I do actually. Because um, I was writing as fast as I can and I just thought I was one. You said um, the enemies that challenge us are the unbalanced natural forces, but right. the enemies that we can fight are. And I tried to remember what you said, greed, fear, lies. Yeah, well, corporate greed is right up there corporate on top of my list. Right up on top. Right, yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear the corporate part. Yeah, I don't think I said it, but, but it's, it's there. And uh, insularity, insularity. In, in the sense of people who only see their own little bit of things. Do you, yeah, mind, do you mind me chiming in from our yeah. tradition? From our tradition, there are four principal ones. Ruthlessness, apathy, ignorance, and unenlightened self-interest. <laughs> unenlightened self-interest, yeah. of which many of the oh, other nice. ones that she had said actually fall into. Yeah. People who do not have the concept of fact-checking. Yeah. Yeah. People who say they ignorance. hate fact-check, they don't pay attention to fact-checkers. Yeah. Well, Nicole and Mike saying that. I think it's right up there because uh, I have a little list. Yes. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we, have, we have to stop now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we're past time. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Diana.